in Richmond, people care about the governor's race. The reason the Virginia race is important is that it's a test run for that big next set of contests in 2018. The Virginia State Capitol, we're just over 100 miles south of Washington, D.C., but for the next 24 hours, the eyes of the American political world will be fixed upon this Jeffersonian temple and the rest of the Commonwealth as we decide who will lead our government for the next four years. You are very welcome to join this campaign. I'm ready to lead the fight. Are you fired up? We will fight for you. In the last few months of this election, both major party candidates have struck similar tones on some issues. And in the wake of a divisive 2016 presidential campaign, both Ralph Northam and Ed Gillespie have been praised for the civility of their debates and a lack of personal attacks. But in the past few weeks, the gloves have come off and the tensions have sharpened. Ralph Northam proudly supported the automatic restoration of rights for child predators like John Bowen. Ed Gillespie wants to end a woman's right to choose. Ralph Northam, weak on MS-13. Enron Ed Gillespie, he's selling you out too. Accusations of fear-mongering and race-baiting flew from both sides. Campaign ads depicted the opposition as unethical, dishonest, or worse. They don't agree on anything that really matters. But what is the truth about these two men? Where did they come from? How did they get here? Eddie was, you know, leading from the stands back in 1979. Ed Gillespie's a smart guy. I do know Northam was not terribly political, certainly prior to running for office. I said to him, um, you really need to be thinking about being governor one day. Tonight, CBS 6 takes an unfiltered look at the two contenders vying to be the next governor. Are you ready to keep Virginia blue? We cannot afford four more years of a liberal governor in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Ralph Northam accepted the nomination of the Democratic Party nearly 10 years to the day after he first got into politics. A native of Virginia's eastern shore, Northam was born in the tiny town of Nassau in 1959. The son of a judge and a nurse, he was raised on a farm in the equally small Onancock. For hundreds of years, Northam's family has lived on this small stretch of land that separates the Chesapeake Bay from the Atlantic Ocean. As a teenager, Northam succeeded academically and in sports, especially on the baseball diamond. But as high school came to an end, Northam chose a path that had the potential to send him overseas and far away from home. He enrolled at the Virginia Military Institute. I just know that he was well-liked, well-regarded, and, and, and by the people who, his classmates, his brother rats as we call them, uh, always uh, had great respect for, for how he conducted himself, his judgment, and of course he was an outstanding student, did very well academically. And it was during his senior year that Northam won his first election. VMI uh, has a very strict honor code, it has always had a strict honor code, a cadet shall not lie, cheat or steal. Northam was elected president of the honor court, the body of students that decides when a cadet has been found guilty of some kind of infraction, whether he should be kicked out of school. The person that you ask to be head of the honor card, it's not Mr. Popularity necessarily. It's not a student council election. It's not most likely to succeed. You pick the person to be head of the honor court that you have the most significant respect for their maturity and their judgment and their fairness. We will fight for you. When Ed Gillespie won the Republican primary, he was given a second chance to claim one of Virginia's most powerful elected offices, something he had nearly done three years earlier. The son of an Irish immigrant, Gillespie was born in 1961 and grew up in Browns Mills, New Jersey, about halfway between Philadelphia and the Jersey Shore. His parents ran a mom and pop grocery store. But with a picture of President John F. Kennedy on the dining room wall, it seemed Gillespie was destined to end up in Washington, D.C. After graduating from high school, he headed to the nation's capital to attend the Catholic University of America. Eddie was... Um you know, leading from the stands back in 1979. An aspiring journalist, Gillespie was known for writing short stories about his friends. They also remember him as a relentless cheerleader and a stellar athlete. Our sophomore year, we 
we played rugby together. I was the scrum half and he was the right wing. And Eddie, uh, I don't know, he's probably a little bit slower now, but he was fast as lightning. I don't think anybody can outwork Eddie, and definitely I don't think anyone can outrun Ed. And as you know, I guess he's still running. And to help pay the bills, he parked cars at the U.S. Senate, a sign perhaps that life wouldn't take him too far from the campus he loved. It was a great experience. We had, uh, you know, Ed Gillespie, the future governor of Virginia. Uh, we had uh, Brian Williams, uh, the nightly news with Brian Williams. He was... Uh, one of our, uh, you know, dorm mates, um, and it was just a wonderful time there. Uh, so, um, it must have been, uh, you know, the the, the water that uh, inspired so, so many people. Both Ralph Northam and Ed Gillespie have credited their early years out of college with shaping their journey towards seeking public office, but their paths have been very different and was an army doctor for eight years. After graduating from VMI, second Lieutenant Ralph Northam felt the call to medicine. He attended Eastern Virginia Medical School and would later become a pediatric neurologist. He met his wife during his residency. Northam's military obligations would take him to Germany in the early 1990s, where he treated soldiers who had been wounded on the battlefield during Operation Desert Storm. After eight years of active duty service, he returned home and began practicing at a children's hospital in Norfolk. Ralph has had to be a good listener, and he's had to convey often very difficult news without whitewashing it, but also offering some hope and some options. As governor, I'll be both compassionate and protecting of Virginia families. Ed Gillespie found his calling a short drive down Michigan Avenue from his college campus. He started his career in politics as an intern for Congressman Andy Ireland. When the Florida Democrat jumped to the GOP, Gillespie did too. He met his wife, Kathy, while playing on a co-ed congressional softball team, and a short time later, he found his political soulmate, Texas Congressman Dick Armey. Well, we're spread across the country. It was under the tutelage of the future House Majority Leader that Gillespie would become one of the most influential voices and minds in the Republican Party. I think more and more voters are, are learning those facts. And in 1994, he co-authored The Contract with America, a document of promises credited with helping the GOP pick up more than 60 House and Senate seats. I've known him in Washington since the, uh, since the 90s, um, and he has always been at the center of Republican politics always and has been considered a, uh, a sort of uh, by now at the age he is a wise man in Republican politics uh, and so it's it's interesting to and has been to watch uh, the kind of strategists from the sideline then go on to the field. Ralph Northam and Ed Gillespie are now key leaders in Virginia political circles but it took years of successes and setbacks for both men to reach the top as their party's nominee for governor. In 2007, Ralph Northam decided to try his surgical hand at politics. A self-described moderate who had voted for George W. Bush twice, Northam ran as a Democrat in Virginia's 6th District, which includes parts of Norfolk, Virginia Beach, and the Eastern Shore where he grew up. Running a well-financed campaign, Northam upset State Senator Nick Raris, who had been in the General Assembly for eight years. I think Northam's background as a doctor and as a physician, as someone who entered that debate not just as a politician, but saying, here's what I think is reasonable from a physician's perspective, has posed him in a very good stead in Democratic politics. His victory helped Democrats reclaim control of the state Senate, but he arrived in Richmond without much fanfare. He was very much the old archetype of a Southern gentleman. He, he was soft-spoken, uh, didn't, didn't raise his voice a lot on the floor, didn't really, uh, you know, he, he wasn't one of the really uh, impassioned debaters that you'd see, as, as many freshman lawmakers are when they come into the Senate. Still, now Senator Tim Kaine, who was governor at the time, says he noticed Northam's potential immediately. Within three months after coming to the Senate, I had him in my office and I said, you know, I really think you would be a good governor one day. I don't know whether that's what you want to do. I have no idea whether Pam would be interested in it, but just in terms of what you bring to the table, I think you'd be a great governor. But he wasn't the only one who thought Northam had potential. A number of Republicans began to think they may have found a kindred spirit. Hey, 
In the year 2000, Ed Gillespie co-founded a bipartisan <laughs> lobbying so firm with Democrat Jack Mike Quinn. Quinn it became a massive success with Fortune 500 clients such as Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Verizon, Hilton, and, as his opponents have pointed out, Enron. Well, certainly Ralph Northam has spent much of this campaign trying to make it into an expletive, calling him Enron uh, Ed, trying to contrast Ralph Northam in his white doctor suit to uh, a lobbyist for all kinds of uh, issues and, uh, and big corporations that people might not be uh, initially favorably uh, disposed toward. A lobbyist is nothing more than someone who's hired to be able to represent a broad group of people so that they don't have to all travel to Washington and go make their case known. You hire somebody to do that for you. In 2003, Gillespie became the chairman of the Republican National Committee and also became a fixture on cable news and Sunday morning talk shows. From our perspective at the RNC... One of Gillespie's frequent sparring partners was Terry McAuliffe, another Catholic University graduate who served as Democratic National Committee chair from 2000 until 2005. McAuliffe would later transition from strategist to candidate himself, first running for governor of the Commonwealth in 2009 before winning in 2013. I do think that Terry McAuliffe's rise in Virginia politics prompted Ed Gillespie to do the same thing. I think there's a natural rivalry between the two that goes back to their Catholic University days and the fact that they're both notable Catholic University alumni. And I think when Ed Gillespie saw the success Terry McAuliffe was having in Virginia, he said, I, I can do this. I want to do this. In the summer of 2007, Gillespie joined the Bush White House and served as counselor to the president until Bush left office. A short time later, he'd get a call asking him to help Republicans take back the Virginia governor's mansion. Two thousand nine was a turning point for both Ralph Northam and Ed Gillespie. Northam was just getting started here at the State House, and Gillespie would get a call from a state attorney general who had loftier goals. Two thousand nine was an up and down year for Ralph Northam in the General Assembly. From an outsider's perspective, the sophomore lawmaker was having great success. Most notably, he was the architect of a law that is considered one of Tim Kaine's signature legislative achievements a statewide smoking ban. It was something that Kane had tried to pass twice unsuccessfully. For the third and final attempt, he put it in the hands of the doctor from the Eastern Shore. And so Ralph had the insight that if we can get restaurant owners on board, it'll make it easier to pass this time. And they ought to get on board once they know if it's the same rule for everybody, they're not gonna lose customers. So he got it through the legislature um, and he did a very good job, even though at that point he'd only been in the Senate one year. But during that same session, Northam was growing frustrated, upset about a blockade on judicial vacancies in the Hampton Roads area and a lack of state funding for Eastern Virginia Medical School, where he attended. Then came a tweet from the head of Virginia's Republican Party, which read, big news coming out of the state Senate. Apparently one Dem is either switching or leaving the Dem caucus. Negotiations for power sharing underway. Jeff Frederick was talking about Northam. Had he decided to switch parties, the Republicans would have taken control of the Senate. Northam ended up staying with the Democrats. But how close did he come to leaving? Now he says, and there is some evidence of this, that it was more of a negotiating position. He was trying to get more out of uh, the, the Democrats in the legislature. And uh, he succeeded in some ways. So uh, who knows? Who knows what was true? The caucus doors are closed for a reason. <laughs> and, and that's... Uh, that's one of the, that's a key example there. At the time, the Washington Post reported that Senate Majority Leader Dick Sasslaw escorted Northam to the governor's office. Tim Kaine has never spoken publicly about what happened during that meeting until now. I believe that there were some people on the other side who had been around a long time who were kind of working a line on Ralph because he was so new. And so, and so I, I called him to the office and I said, look, both of these issues, getting judges appointed and treating EVMS right, you're right on both of these issues, but you need to you know, scrutinize a little bit what some of the motives are of people who might offer things to you to help them out. And we did have that conversation, but it was, it was frankly during that conversation where I said to him, um, you really need to be thinking about being governor one day. And, and you know, to, to get there, there's gonna be some moments where you know, you're, you're a nice guy, but you may have to realize some people are playing tough with you and you gotta play tough back.
In 2009, cracks were beginning to show in the facade of Virginia's traditional red state status. Barack Obama had won the state in 2008, the first time a Democratic presidential candidate had done so since LBJ. For the first time in decades, the Commonwealth's two U.S. Senators were both Democrats, and the party had won two gubernatorial races in a row. Attorney General Bob McDonnell had won the Republican nomination that year. He was taking on Creed Deeds, a man he had narrowly defeated four years prior in one of the closest races in state history. So McDonnell turned to Ed Gillespie. Ed was the chairman of my campaign back in 09, and, uh, you know, he with no salary, I didn't want a salary, just like, I want to be your advisor, I want to be able to help you uh, fashion a message, but I want to get my hands deeply into the policy. He was intense on, on getting good policies. Ed Gillespie's a smart guy. Uh, he, he plays the game well, he's, uh, he's, he's articulate, he's well versed in the issues, and uh, he knows how to make direct appeals to voters. McDonnell says his decision paid off when a thesis that he had written 20 years prior began to make headlines. In the paper, which McDonnell wrote while attending Regent University, he described working women and feminists as detrimental to the traditional family. I remember having a big powwow the night that actually came out. I was spending the night at Ed's house and uh, we were uh, bracing ourselves for the Washington Post the next morning thinking, okay, this might, be, this might not be as good as I would like about my wonderful college thesis. And so uh, anyway, it came out and Ed, you know, of course I didn't like it. Ed was very calm and said, you know, here's the points that are good. Here's, what we're here's a strategy of how we need to talk about it. And it just gave me a sense of peace that, you know, it's like it's 20 years old, we'll deal with it. I'll be honest about what I wrote, what I thought, you know, and uh, we'll go from there. McDonald weathered the criticism that followed and with Gillespie's guidance, handily defeated deeds in the general election. You know, he was just, uh, I thought, well, I'm sure glad I have a guy. It's been in the you know, been in the crisis rooms in the, in the Oval Office sitting here, you know, guiding me as uh, running for candidate for governor. While this campaign has been largely free of controversy, both Ralph Northam and Ed Gillespie are no strangers to it. Both drew national attention during high profile political fights. If Ralph Northam found his calling in medicine, many say he found his political voice in early 2012. You're trying to fix things. Excuse me. Says ultrasound. During that General Assembly session, Republican Jill Vogel sponsored Senate Bill 484, which would have required a woman to undergo an ultrasound 24 hours prior to having an abortion. Many states have, have passed the legislation. And more importantly, what I, I find interesting is that the majority of people actually believe that it's a good, that it's fair and it's a good law. But because of the way it was written, the bill likely would have required many women in their first trimester to undergo an internal transvaginal ultrasound. Criticism mounted, with opponents blasting that provision as invasive and medically unnecessary. My the legislation drew national attention with Democrats, women's groups, and the pro-choice community accusing state Republicans of waging a war on women. This wasn't even like a once a session kind of bill. This was really, you know, kind of a, a once in a... I don't know, once in a blue moon kind of thing where you have national media coming down, you have uh, protesters literally lining the walk from the General Assembly building to the Capitol, every, you know, just about every foot of it, which is a, you know, it's a fair amount of distance to travel by foot. Northam, the only doctor in the state Senate, called the legislation an assault on women's health care and an insult to his fellow physicians. That gave him this sort of expert level authority that, uh, that had not been really heard as much in that debate. There, there used to be more doctors in the legislature. There's fewer these days. And, and so he, he, him coming from that perspective, I think, uh, gave his voice a little bit more prominence in the debate. Amid the furor, the bill was amended, so it would only require an external ultrasound. The outrage and concerns ultimately persuaded Vogel to pull her bill, though a similar piece of legislation passed the House and was eventually signed into law. Still, Northam had made his presence felt, and it set the stage for his election as lieutenant governor the following year. There's a lot of outspoken people in the GA, and, and up to that point, Ralph Northam just hadn't been one of them. And, uh, you know, it, it really is where he found his voice. The Commonwealth of Virginia! In 2014, veteran political strategist Ed Gillespie, who had spent years helping other candidates win elections, decided to become one himself. 
His target, U.S. Senator Mark Warner, one of the most popular political figures in Virginia. It was a David and Goliath. From the beginning, Gillespie faced an uphill battle. Initially, many people thought Ed Gillespie was not conservative enough to, to win the base in Virginia. But the Washington Insider convinced rural Virginia and other state Republicans that he was the man for the job, and in June of that year, won the nomination at the GOP convention in Roanoke. It's not flashy. It's about going to the Republican pancake breakfast in southwest Virginia or the bingo night in northern Virginia. And what I know about Ed Gillespie is that essentially since 2012-2013, He's been crisscrossing the state, going to these events where there may be only a dozen people in the room. A lot of times people will vote for someone that they have met, that they've looked in the eye, and that they've shaken their hand. Gillespie trailed Warner in most polls for the entirety of the race, many times by double digits. On election day, pundits were still predicting a sizable victory for Warner, but things didn't turn out that way. I was at Mark Warner's campaign headquarters on election night in 2014. At the beginning of the day, everyone thought this was going to be an easy win, an early night. And then throughout the day, you could visibly see the staffers start to sweat and start to get nervous. What was supposed to be an easy win for a popular incumbent turned into a nail biter. Many parts of the state that had supported Warner in 2008 voted for Gillespie. Warner would not be declared the winner until a day later. When all was said and done, he and Gillespie separated by less than one point. Obviously, it did not move in the direction that we hoped it would. Observers attributed some of Gillespie's unexpected success to a strong social media campaign and solid debate performances. And there was some regret in Republican circles that they hadn't given Gillespie more support. I've seen the man's work ethic. He is tireless. And uh, so when, uh, when it came out to be a lot closer than we thought against, the Mark, against Mark Warner, who was viewed as being unbeatable, it, it really didn't surprise me because I knew how hard Ed was working. I mean, if, honestly, if he'd gotten a little more money from some of the national political establishment, you know, he might have pulled that, uh, on that race up. But experts say there was someone else that factored into that election, a name that wasn't even on the ballot, Barack Obama. Democrats lost almost everything nationally in 2014. Uh, it's amazing in some ways that Mark Warner won re-election. It was an interesting moment in time. It was the end, you know, we're approaching the end of the Obama era. And uh, he was, Warner was facing a, a heavy, uh, yeah, a heavy backlash against, um, against uh, Obama era policies. And uh, Ed Gillespie part uh, partly on that, but mostly, I think, on his own merit, uh, performed exceptionally well in that race. The June primary served as testing grounds for both Ralph Northam and Ed Gillespie. The road to becoming their party's nominee was years in the making, but did not come without roadblocks. In 2013, Democrats swept the top three elected offices in Virginia state government. Terry McAuliffe, the longtime Democratic operative and fundraiser, was elected governor. State Senator Mark Herring was chosen to be the new attorney general. Both are from Northern Virginia and both won very close races over their Republican opponents. By contrast, Ralph Northam, the soft-spoken doctor from the Eastern Shore, easily won his race, defeating conservative firebrand E.W. Jackson by more than 10 points. I just remember, I mean, his lieutenant governor campaign was was so basic. I remember I had a, was doing a profile on him for WTVR, and he just called me on the phone and said, "Hey, could you just show up at this Starbucks and we can talk?" I mean, that was that was his style back back then. Very folksy, very down to earth. Certainly uh, not someone who adapted the D.C. mantra. But for the next four years, Northam would largely be overshadowed by McAuliffe and Herring, who would often receive national attention for their statements and actions regarding hot button issues like gay marriage, abortion, health care, voting rights and immigration. In fact, many believed Herring, not Northam, would be the Democratic candidate for governor in 2017. This is one of the big questions that I think historians of Virginia politics are going to look at. Uh, down the road. But I would tell you that I was a little surprised 
when Mark Herring decided that he wasn't going to challenge Ralph Northam. In September of 2015, Herring announced that in 2017 he would seek re-election as Attorney General, not Governor. Herring said it was a personal decision made for a combination of reasons, including family and that he loves his current job. But others believe the path for Ralph Northam was cleared by someone else. I would suspect that the governor might have had something to do with how everything played out. Maybe Governor McAuliffe signaled that he felt that Ralph Northam would be a stronger candidate in a general election, largely because he had some more moderate views than Mark Herring did and maybe would be it would be easier for him to win. Northam announced his intention to run for governor that November, and for more than a year it seemed like he would get the Democratic nomination unopposed. But in January of 2017, former Congressman Tom Perriello announced that he would challenge Northam. It was a move that caught many Democrats by surprise and set the stage for a spirited and sometimes volatile primary between the two men. While they agreed on many issues, Perriello frequently brought up Northam's prior support of George W. Bush and touted his endorsements from progressive stalwarts like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. His plan calls for close to a half a billion dollars. And I think this probably goes to the heart of understanding why Dr. Northam voted for George W. Bush. But Northam leaned heavily on his record in the General Assembly, his military service, his experience as a physician, and what he called an ability to reach across the aisle when necessary. While polls had them close, on primary day, Northam cruised to a decisive victory. While he had fallen just short of his bid to take Mark Warner's seat in the U.S. Senate, Ed Gillespie's performance in that race elevated his stature within the party and his focus shifted from Washington to Richmond. In September of 2015, aides close to Gillespie confirmed that he was planning a run for governor. He made it official the following month, after State Senator Mark Obenshane announced he would not run. At one point, Obenshane was seen as the Republicans' next great hope after losing an extremely close contest to Mark Herring in 2013. But to many, it was clear this was Gillespie's time. Remember, in Richmond, people care about the governor's race. They sure are active in the presidential races and they're active in the senators ra senatorial races, but the establishment, the political establishment in Richmond, this is their Super Bowl, the gubernatorial race. And for the Republicans involved in the Richmond GOP establishment, they want a horse that they can win with. And after his performance against Mark Warner in 2014, they thought the horse was Ed Gillespie. But Gillespie would not go unchallenged in the primary. He faced several challengers, including Congressman Rob Whitman, State Senator Frank Wagner, businessman Denver Riggleman, and Corey Stewart, the conservative chairman of the Prince William County Board of Supervisors. Whitman and Riggleman would ultimately drop out, leading pundits to believe and polls to indicate that Gillespie would easily win the nomination. But as Mark Warner had learned in 2014, what's expected and what actually happens are often two very different things. Except this time, it was Gillespie playing the role of Goliath. I think the big surprise, actually, was how close Corey Stewart came to Ed Gillespie in the primary. The anti-establishment Stewart, perhaps best known for his full-throated defense of Virginia's Confederate monuments, hit Gillespie hard questioning his conservative credentials, criticizing his past as a lobbyist, and attempting to paint him as an out-of-touch elitist. The difference is we need to expand our Second Amendment rights in the Commonwealth. And while most polls show Gillespie up by double digits before primary day, it turned into a surprisingly close contest. I think that was a unique phenomenon. I think uh, Corey found a way to use social media and grassroots politics a very, very effectively, maybe maybe a little bit better than, uh, than the Gillespie campaign, at least for primary purposes. Um, but, uh, but I think Ed's using those same channels of communication for the general election. Gillespie ended up winning by a little more than one point. Virginia is one of two states electing a new governor this year. The decision for Virginia voters comes exactly one year after a man selling himself as a D.C. outsider shook up Washington. And that begs the question, how will President Trump impact this race? The obstructionist Democrats would like us not to do it, but believe me, we have to close down our government. We're building that wall. We have uh, a very divided country. Uh, 
I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. It is often the case that in Virginia's governor's race, the person sitting in the Oval Office looms large. In a world that is suddenly empty. Strengthening the policy. We're moving along. But while the words and tweets from President Donald Trump dominate the airwaves in the Commonwealth and across the nation, his influence on Election Day remains to be seen. There is some empirical evidence to suggest the mere presence of a Republican in the White House is good for Democrats. The president has been a factor for 48 years in Virginia. We call it the curse. The traditional conventional wisdom of the old Virginia curse, which says that the opposite party, uh, the governor will be of the opposite party of the president, would favor Northam, but I think that all of us now know that uh, we, we take conventional wisdom with a grain of salt. Terry McAuliffe defied the odds four years ago, but if Ed Gillespie is to do the same, he will have done so following a different playbook than he did in 2014. He is running a more values-based campaign than he did last time, uh, and so it's a, it's a tougher a constituency for Gillespie to run where he's basically trying to appeal both to the Trump voter but also a more traditional Republican voter and then also any kind of swing voters that might be out there. So for him the challenge is not so much money but the shifted landscape. The president has tweeted his support of Gillespie but has not campaigned with him. Observers say that has likely been Gillespie's call, that the candidate has tried to embrace some of the tools, techniques and messages of Donald Trump without fully embracing Trump himself. Virginia was the one southern state that didn't support Trump, and that in fact Hillary Clinton carried Virginia by more than Barack Obama carried it in 2012. And so that has made it sort of a tightrope for Ed Gillespie. Ralph Northam has been a vocal critic of the president, in the past referring to him as a narcissistic maniac and a dangerous man. Though Northam has recently said he would work with Trump on issues that benefit Virginians, Democrats are hoping the president's unpopularity will drive their voters to the polls. The Democrats claim they're more energized, and certainly Trump has provided an element of, of energy. Loads of people who vote for president don't vote for governor. They also don't vote for city council. The city council probably has more effect on their lives than any other category of public office. But they don't get it. They vote for president, which has less effect in, in times of peace at least. Campaigns expect the unexpected, but sometimes something happens that no one has prepared for. In Virginia in 2017, that happened on a sunny Saturday in Charlottesville. Peace was interrupted and chaos exploded in Charlottesville on August 12th thrusting the issue of hate and the debates surrounding Virginia's Confederate monuments to the forefront of the 2017 gubernatorial race. A rally to save a statue of Robert E. Lee erupted into violence with white nationalists and counter-protesters fighting in the streets. A young woman was killed when police say a white nationalist from Ohio intentionally drove his car into a group of people marching. Both Ralph Northam and Ed Gillespie have condemned the white supremacists and neo-Nazis involved in the bloodshed, but they have taken different positions when it comes to the monuments. Northam has said they should be removed and put in museums. Gillespie has said the statues should stay where they are, but they should be placed in historical context so people can learn from them. It's far from the only issue the candidates disagree on, and in many ways, both men are the product of the current political landscape. Our parties in the modern period in America have never been further apart. Democrats are to the left, Republicans are to the right, and you can sprinkle in some populism as well, but they don't agree on anything that really matters. But something both sides will admit to is that this race is a test run for the next set of contests in 2018. The reason the Virginia race is important is that the national parties are looking for what methods work, both to turn out the base, how to, how to capture swing voters, how cultural issues play, or maybe voters care not at all about the values and cultural issues, but they care about the pocketbook issues. We want you to know that we not only will listen to you, we will fight for you. Are you ready to go? Ralph Northam and Ed Gillespie have taken very different paths in life, but they have now come to the same place, and tomorrow their journey ends. In the days and weeks leading up to the election, each has had a former president campaign on his behalf. 
Each has been responsible for attack ads, and each has been attacked. Both have had their donations and financial interests put under the microscope by journalists and watchdogs. While the candidates' positions and stances on certain issues have been criticized, the race has largely been free of legitimate scandals. Friends of Ralph Northam and Ed Gillespie say that's because of their moral and ethical traits. I just think it, it's just a tribute to the character that he already had that was shown, but he's also just developed a balance and a maturity and a, and a listening style that's a little bit non-traditional. So in some ways, he's bringing some non-traditional skills to the position, but I think Virginians would sleep very well at night knowing that somebody with as good a judgment as Ralph Northam was their governor. He's got a, I visited him a couple times at his house. He's got this beautiful thing on his, on his wall that his, his father had given him uh, about the, uh, the sort of the Irish pledge for the immigrants that came through Ellis Island, where my grandfather came through as well. And we looked at it, but it's all about you know, hard working, about pursuing dreams, not making excuses, taking advantage of your God-given talents, uh, and, and doing the best you can uh, for your family and for, for others around you. And, and that's, that's what he puts on his wall in all privacy. And, and that's, the, that's the man that he is. It's very interesting because in some ways these are fairly similar candidates. They're both seen as, um, if you talk to people who know them well, as sort of moderate representatives of their party. Uh, they're not going to say that in the campaign too often, but that's clearly how they're perceived. They are the opposite of the candidates we saw in 2016. Uh, both Clinton and Trump had sharp edges, and people felt very, very strongly about them. If you know Gillespie and Northam at all, you realize they don't really have sharp edges. Some of their policy positions may have sharp edges, but personally, they are amiable, they're easy to get along with. Uh, I think almost anybody would enjoy having a beer with either one of them. Larry Sabato has said since he started following governor's races in the 1960s, one thing about off-year races has always proven true. Voter turnout is going to be low. You can find out more about Ralph Northam and Ed Gillespie on our website, WTVR.com. You can also find an interview with Libertarian candidate Cliff Hyra at Capitol Square. I'm Jake Burns. And I'm Bill Fitzgerald. Good night, and don't forget to vote.